We uh, are a community of practice that, that develops and shares research, innovations, and resources related to EGR programming. And um, we do a variety of work. Uh, this, we've done a variety of work this year, one of which has been this tremendous early grade reading uh, training program, which has uh, been implemented both uh, in person, but also via webinar to ensure that we can reach our audience as far as we can globally. And um, we also have uh, re released a variety of um, useful toolkits, and, and recently uh, we'll be releasing a toolkit focused on supporting literacy for children with disabilities. So please look for a note about that in the next few days. Um, there's lots of information about the Global Reading Network at our website, which is www.globalreadingnetwork.net, or NET. Net, um, and there is a great repository of reading programs, of publications, useful tools and resources to support you in your reading project, as well as uh, um, all, all the various publications that the Global Reading Network has released over the years. Um, we have a variety of pre presenters for the webinar, including Allison Flepson, who is a, our reading pr program specialist on our team, Amy Palangio, who is a technical advisor, Arister Glimo, who is our training curriculum specialist, Adrian Barnes, from Florida State University, who is one of the co-authors of our early grade reading training program, and Marian Fesmere from Florida State as well, who worked with Adrian and with Allison and the others here on putting this together. I'd like to tell you, share a little bit about our webinar series, the goal, the content, and the approach. Um, the purpose of the series is to provide participants with evidence-based information, guidance, resources, and resources to support the design and implementation of effective EGR initiatives. This was a collaborative effort uh, uh, by Allison and Marion and Adrian and the others um, with a variety of implementers of really great reading programs in the, around the world, so you'll get some wonderful up-to-date information on experiences uh, from the field. Each session is focused on a key technical topic and includes a summary of research, experiences, and best practices to date. We will be weaving in issues related to gender equity, uh, use of ICTs, and inclusive education throughout the different webinars. In addition, you will there issues related to EGR program monitoring, evaluation, scale up, and sustainability will be addressed during our webinars as well. And there will be opportunities for interaction and questions throughout each webinar. So please feel free to use your chat to enter any questions along the way, and we'll have pauses during the webinar, and we'll keep track of those questions. We'll make sure that they're answered. In terms of the webinar session topics and dates, Dates thus far, we've had the introduction to EGR improvement, resources for teaching and learning early grade reading, and key early grade reading skills and strategies for effective instruction and assessment. Um, I believe the first two, the resources from that webinar have been put online, and from the third webinar, they should be online very soon, so you should be able to find them at the globalreadingnetwork.net website. Today, of course, the focus is on language considerations in early grade reading programs. Um, but we would also like you to look for the other two that are coming up on November 15th and 27th, which are focused on teacher professional development and coaching, as well as bringing uh, programs to scale. And to register for those webinars, you would use the same approach as you did before, but you can, I, we've left the uh, uh, website link there for you, if you'd like to copy it down very quickly, to um, register for that. I'd like to introduce our two facilitators today. Our first one will be Allison Fletson. As I said, she's our reading program specialist. Allison supports the design and development of resources and professional development opportunities for Global Reading Network. She has 15 years of experience designing and managing education-related programs in Sub-Saharan Africa. Prior to REACH, she worked for six years at RTI, where she helped design and implement early grade literacy programs, assessments, training manuals, and resources. An area of particular interest to Allison is language use and education, especially as it relates to reading and language learning. Adrian Barnes, who is, joined, is a literacy and pedagogy specialist at the Learning Systems Institute at Florida State University. And she's also there on the screen. She has over 17 years of experience in education environments, education research in American schools, as well as international education and development. She currently provides technical support to early grade reading initiatives in Nigeria, including the USAID-supported NEI Plus project, the Bayero University 
Florida State Partnership in Kano State, and a UNICEF-supported effort to adapt early grade reading materials to the Kanuri language. She supports East Aid Honduras's reading act activity, and for the past year, she's been collaborating with REACH to develop and deliver professional development on early grade reading programs. Prior to her international work, Dr. Barnes taught elementary school, and she received her master's and doctoral degrees from FSU in 2011 and 15, where she's a fellow with the Florida Center for Reading Research. Hi, thank you, Jennifer, for the introduction. Um, Adrian and I are both very excited to be with you today to talk about an issue that we both um, have been working on for quite some time and have heard from many, many people in the Global Reading Network is an issue that you are addressing and grappling with in many ways throughout all aspects of your programs. And while we have touched on it uh, throughout the different webinars, and we will continue to do so, we certainly feel it's a big enough topic that it really merits its own webinar. So as we look about, uh, as we think about what we're going to be discussing today, um, bringing up this slide with the objectives which you can look through. Um, as we know, language is central to any early grade reading program. It touches on every aspect of what we're doing from curriculum development to materials development to teacher training and assessment. So this session is designed to help everyone who's involved in different aspects of early grade reading improvement initiatives to understand and help navigate the many issues um, that language touches on. In this session, we're going to provide you with an overview of the important role that language plays in reading and language acquisition. We're going to be discussing the evidence um, on providing children with instruction in a language that they and their teachers understand and why doing so is essential to effective reading and language learning. We will also answer some language-related questions that we hear commonly from the implementers of early grade reading programs, including what languages should we be using? How do we choose them? And how do we decide which languages to use? What does the language, how does the language of early grade reading instruction affect what skills are taught and how we're teaching those skills across different languages? Should, they, should children learn to read in multiple languages? And if so, how do we actually go about that? And how do we develop materials in, sometimes in multiple languages in the countries where we're working in, in a cost-effective and timely manner? So those are just some of the questions we've heard, and we hope to hear many more from you, as well as about your experiences throughout today's session. Um, we encourage your team to consult the resources that are provided along with this presentation, which you, if you haven't received an email with a link to some of the handouts we'll, we will reference today, you, will, you should do so um, shortly. We're not going to be spending a lot of time on those supplemental resources, as, but we will indicate where they are um, during the presentation and how they might be of use for you. Um, and as Jennifer already said, while we understand that the nature of a webinar creates some kinds of barriers to discussion, we really have been trying throughout the previous webinars to address your questions and comments, to provide opportunities for dialogue, both with the presenters, but also amongst yourself through the chat. Um, some, some good conversations have taken place that way. People have shared what they're doing. And so please submit yours throughout the presentation, and then we have built-in opportunities where we'll, we will be um, taking those questions and hearing from your experiences. When you do send them via the chat, please note you need to send them to all panelists and attendees for others to see them. So I'm going to turn this now over to Adrian. Um, excuse me, sorry. I'm going to keep going here for just a little bit as we talk about uh, first why language is a con critical consideration um, in early grade reading improve for early grade reading improvement initiatives. Language and literacy really go hand in hand. Um, we can't really have one without the other, other, as the saying goes. Children learn to read more easily and effectively when they learn to read in a language that they already speak and understand, which is an important consideration when we think about how we, sh how we set up our instructional approaches. Many decisions regarding your early grade literacy and, la and reading programs are related to language. For example, how will the approach to instruction be differentiated depending on the language, the amount of time that children need to learn different skills? Language-related issues, as, as we have all discovered in our work, are often sensitive and multifaceted. They're not confined to the classroom. They're often related to a number of sociocultural and political issues, um, both within the education sector and outside of it. Language can be tied to ethnicity. It can be used as a way to reinforce political or cultural power of one group over another, either explicitly or implicitly. 
So addressing one issue related to language often uncovers many others that need to be addressed, including issues related to dialect or orthography or attitudes and beliefs about a, a, a different language. Um, language is also a significant factor in providing equitable and inclusive education. More and more attention is being paid to equity in education generally, but also in early grade reading programs specifically. Many of you may be familiar with the equity initiative led by FHI 360 and Save the Children um, to understand how different groups of children may or may not be learning or have access to learning opportunities and, and have the same learning outcomes as others. And language is a significant factor that we need to pay attention to when we talk about, about equity. And this is particularly true for certain marginalized groups um, due to ethnicity or being minority status. It can also be true for girls in some contexts as they may have less exposure to a second or additional language that may be the language of uh, instruction. And addressing and integrating language issues generally is just very critical to the success of early grade reading programs. We know that programs who maybe have not addressed these have um, not been able to achieve their objectives all the time with getting all children reading. So the sooner they're addressed and in the most collaborative manner, the better. So before we start, we want to give you an opportunity to chat with us, to share your experience with us a little bit more about your experiences in the chat box. Please take just a couple minutes to share with us some of the issues you feel your program has encountered when you've been language related issues that you've encountered in your reading programs? What issues do you feel you've been able to successfully address? What issues do you feel that you haven't been able to successfully address or been as successful as you would like? You can share your thoughts there in the Zoom and we'll pause for that and then summarize what we're hearing from you. Thank you everyone for sharing. Keep uh, you're welcome to keep sharing. I think Adrian's going to just uh, feed back to everybody a little bit about what we're hearing. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much for your um, responses. Um, what I'm seeing, you know, orthography is an issue, right? And we will talk about that a little bit more when you have two languages with orthographies. How do you how do you teach that and how do you manage that? Um, particularly if one is an alphabetic language and one is not an alphabetic language. Um, being um, a language advocate is part of our role as being in these, in these um, countries and in these situations where we're implementing a project. Um, and so advocating for language, that's got to really start in the beginning. Um, I'm also seeing uh, about low proficiency levels, first and second language, you know, should we combine those questions, combine those two languages for instruction? How do we address it when they're, you know, learning in two different languages at the same time? Um, this, this push to shift, the push to shift to English or another maybe post-colonial language is, is huge in a lot of countries. And I think that we really have to look at um, what are the similarities of those languages and, and advocate for illiteracy in the mother tongue. Um, inadequate orthographies, I'm assuming that means that the orthographies haven't been standardized in the language. Um, unfortunately, we do see that, uh, you know, policy, language policies restrict learning. Um, they restrict the number of languages and the, the actual mother tongue that a child is learning in. And a, I know that that's frustrating and I apologize that you have to deal with that. It's frustrating for all of us who are just helping children learn how to read. Um, I'll continue reviewing the comments as they come through and uh, keep, up, keep up with you. Yeah, thank you everyone for that, for sharing that. And we hope as we go through, you can share a little bit more about some of what you're doing, what has been successful and what, what hasn't and what you might suggest to others to, that we, we, we try. Um, once you receive the um, handout, you'll see there is a list summarizing all the issues that we've heard that early grade reading programs are experiencing, and you can kind of look through that list and also add any ones that, that you have had, um, which can be a useful tool to help you with program planning and implementation to think about if you're going to address, if you're going to encounter this issue, how might you start to plan and address it. Before we jump in, I wanted to talk about a terminology just a little bit. It's important to use accurate and context-specific terminology 
with respect to language issues, understanding how terms are used in your country or your particular context um, is really important since not all terms are used in, in all places, of course. Generally speaking, though, throughout this presentation, we're going to use terms um, on, on this slide, uh, one being first language or L1, sometimes referred to as mother tongue. It is the language that a child learns to speak and understand first. As you'll see noted on the slide, a person can have more than one first language. Um, the first language can also be used for different purposes at different times, and proficiency may change over time. So what a person, um, a person may be very fluent in their first language as a child, but then lose it if they are exposed to other languages or perhaps they, they change locations. So L1 proficiency and how, we, how a person use it can change. Um, a second or other language, which we denote by L2 or LX, is a language that a person learns in addition to the first language. In some contexts, children might be frequently exposed to an L2 and become highly proficient in that language to the point one would say that they're bilingual, or they might be infrequently exposed to it, making that second or other language essentially a foreign language. And proficiency in a second language can also change over time, and second languages or other languages can also be used for different purposes. Some other terms that you may have heard in your context or just um, in the field generally are dominant and non-dominant languages. These are terms that um, we hear more and more in the Asian context to refer to languages spoken by majority or minority ethnic or language groups. Many countries also have designated official and national languages, and along with that, they have stated purposes regarding their use in government or education, um, something that affects the policy that some of you have mentioned uh, can be um, also somewhat constraining in certain contexts. Um, the term language of wider communication is sometimes used to refer to languages that are spoken across geographic or political borders. Examples might include Kiswahili in East Africa, or languages even such as English, of course, um, as somebody mentioned, a language that is spoken globally. Um, when discussing language-related issues within the context of early grade reading programs, it's important to be aware that certain terms might have positive or negative connotations depending on the context or audience. For example, in some contexts, the term mother tongue um, is very acceptable and very um, understood by the people working in that environment. But in others, it might be more politically charged and contentious. And other terms such as L1 or home language or language that children speak and understand might be preferable alternatives. Uh, a country's history with respect to language and language use and education might be an influencing factor in how some of these terms are used. So it's important to note that just using them in one context and taking them over to another might not always be appropriate and, and we should take time to understand what terminology is most appropriate and also make sure that people working in a given context all have the same understanding of what those terms mean. So <clears throat> this slide uh, summarizes some of the factors to consider when determining how to integrate and address language issues in early grade reading programs, they're summarized in four main categories. These are the sociolinguistic context, the education context, approaches to reading and language instruction, and stakeholder considerations. I know this is a lot in one, in one place, and we're gonna be going through these throughout the presentation, but here I just wanted to present you with kind of the overarching framework for how we're thinking about all the factors that we need to consider in early grade reading programs. So starting with the sociolinguistic context, which refers to the various aspects of the environment in which a language is spoken. This includes the languages and dialects spoken in a specific area, who speaks them, for what purpose, and how well. It also includes the degree to which a language has been developed, if its orthography or writing system has been standardized, and how the language is used. Note that the sociolinguistic context can be different within the same country, and it can also change over time. And we find this more and more in places where there has been significant migration of ethnic groups from one region to the other, or especially in areas where there's been a lot of migration from rural to urban areas. Sometimes what people understood to be the sociolinguistic context, um, even as recently as a couple years ago or a decade ago, is no longer true. And we can help to understand, we're, we help to inform our early grade reading programs when we understand the, the sociolinguistic context in the present day. The education context refers to a country's or region's policies, goals, and practices with respect to education and language. 
This includes official policies, but also the actual practices regarding how language is used in the classroom. It includes student proficiency of different languages, teacher-related language considerations, such as what is teacher's knowledge about reading and skills for teaching reading, their own le level of language and literacy proficiency, um, the degree to which the teachers and the students speak the same language or do don't speak the same language in the classroom. It's also important, of course, to understand the context with respect to availability of teaching and learning materials in different languages and the amount of time that's available in the curriculum to teach uh, reading and to teach language. Being aware of these issues helps to situate the use of language within early grade reading programs and make decisions. Um, the third main category is effective reading and language instruction approaches. This refers to how children learn to read and how they learn language most effectively. It refers to the evidence regarding the critical skills that children need to be taught to learn to read, which Dr. Barnes discussed in the previous webinar. Some of these are not dependent on the language, or in other words, children need to learn these skills no matter what language they speak, uh, though of course there are certain reasons for emphasizing perhaps one skill over the other depending on the language, and you can learn a bit more about that in this webinar as, as well as in the previous webinar. And also the best practices for teaching um, children to read. This um, includes knowledge of how to most effectively teach reading skills that are not necessarily language specific, but some that are language specific. And we need to be mindful of those as we take our approaches to reading from one context and one language to the other. And last but certainly not least, the stakeholder considerations. This refers to the numerous issues related to language use in education, including attitudes and beliefs among parents, teachers, and education authorities about how children learn to read and how they learn language most effectively. Um, as someone already mentioned in the chat, there may be um, preferences among parents and other stakeholders regarding what languages children should learn to speak, um, beliefs about speakers of different languages, the utility of using them, all of these considerations need to be taken into account as they're going to affect how receptive teachers and parents are to any early grade reading program's effort to teach in different languages and can ultimately affect, of course, whether it is successful. So for more information um, on these topics as well, you can look at the resource cited here and we'll be sending out a full list of citation and references along with this presentation. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Barnes, who's going to do a summary of the effective approaches for teaching reading and language. Okay, well, thanks so much. So we're going to talk about, um, it was really good for me to actually read your comments and read through some of the questions that you have, because a lot of the questions are about, you know, how, what does this look like? You know, what do you do in the classroom? What are the effective approaches? Well. You know, research and evidence shows that uh, we, we want to look at the languages themselves, right? And, and the languages themselves can tell us a lot about how we do that instruction. So we want to think about what languages we use for literacy instruction, what skills to teach. Once we understand the sociocultural context, we can begin to identify what languages should be used for literacy instruction. This should be based on the languages that the children speak and understand. The skills that, are, that, are, that need to be taught are dependent upon specific language characteristics. For instance, letter, and, letter or syllable and symbol. So sound symbol, whether if it's alphabetic or if it's syllabic, the symbol to the syllable. Those correlations are taught using the most frequent sounds in the language. But this also means that if two language of languages of instruction have the same letters or symbols, then those letters or symbols should be taught so that um, if, they, if they make the same sound, right, then you show the children, well, you already know this because you know it from your first language. Um, and and, and the, the idea of starting with the most frequent letters and sounds allows the children to start reading and writing faster when they, because those are the most frequent words or sounds in the language. Um, now, the most frequent sounds in language one may not be the most frequent sounds in language two. So even if they do share similar letter sound correspondences, 
when we switch to a second language, we might begin teaching in a different order. But children are taught to read in a language they already understand and speak. When this happens, then learning to read in a new language means that they just learn the sounds and the symbols. When children learn to read, learn how to read in a language they already speak, then they can use all of their linguistic skills to help them learn how to read, use that process. Um, they can predict the language, they know that it's a noun coming up, so I can start looking at that word and thinking of it as a person, place, or thing, which is going to help me learn how to read that better. Um, transitioning from first to second language can be a very, very difficult process, and it's highly dependent upon both the oral language development and the literacy in the first language, as well as the similarities between the languages. An important, and an important concept to note here is this last bullet, is that learning how to read is different from learning how to speak a language. And so those, those need to be differentiated in instruction and provided for at different times throughout the day. We wanna build a strong foundation in a familiar language. Um, because that oral language is the basis for literacy development. It's typically the easiest language in which a child learns how to read. And like I was saying a moment ago, when they already understand the language, they use their linguistic knowledge to support those emergent reading skills. This includes their knowledge of the language structure, vocabulary, their, their ability to decode words and determine meaning. For example, if they decode a word, and they know what the word means, then they know they've decoded it correctly. But if they're decoding in a language that they don't speak very well, they may decode the word and they don't know if it's correct, if it's not, if it's even a real word or if they've said it correctly. So different languages have different numbers of graphemes and sounds associated with those graphemes. And I know that several of the comments um, showed me that many people are familiar with the term orthography and how those uh, letters and sounds fit together and a shallow orthography means that the letters and the sounds only each letter represents one sound and each sound can be represent can be written in one way that's a very shallow orthography which is actually quite common in say african languages but english has a quite deep orthography meaning that a letter represents different sounds depending on the word it shows up in or the spelling pattern and a spelling pattern can be pronounced, so sometimes can be pronounced multiple different ways. That makes it a less transparent or a very deep orthography. So when we're looking at trans, transitioning a child from their first language to their second language, we have to look at what are the similarities. Because if they're different types of orthography, shallow versus deep, that's a whole plethora of new information and new conceptual understanding that the child has to learn. So how, do, how long does it take for a child to learn how to read? Well, as we said, different, different languages have different numbers of graphemes. If the language only has 13 letters, that's going to be different than a language who maybe is a syllabic language and has 200 to 300 symbols. It's going to take time for the children to learn the orthography of the language, be able to blend those sounds to make words, um, and then the complexity of the spelling pattern. It, it's also dependent upon how much time is available for the children to be engaged in teaching and learning activities. Whether the children are exposed to materials that they're able to learn from, read with, both in the classroom, at home, in the community, and are they exposed to good instruction? Now, for most languages around the world, with good instruction, most children should be able to read in a familiar language by the end of grade two. But that's got some assumptions. That's got some assumptions saying, well, they're, they're learning to read in a language that's familiar, they're getting some good quality instruction, and they're getting a lot of practice because the practice is really what builds and continues to strengthen our children's literacy skills. So if you say, well, I just need you to give me the, what is the number? How long is it gonna take a child to learn to read? You really have to look at the context and determine how all of these different moving parts play into that timeline for your children. Now, 
we want to develop a very strong relationship between first and second language learning. That solid foundation in the first language helps children to learn in a second language. When we have strong literacy and language skills as well as content knowledge in the first language, the these support transferring to a second language to support academic achievement and successful reading comprehension. In fact, success in that second language is very, very strongly associated with the oral and written proficiency in the first language. And research indicates that children need to reach a certain level of proficiency in their first language before they're able to really successfully transfer those skills to an L2 or, uh, or, or an LX, like so a second or additional language. <clears throat> That, <coughs> excuse me, that doesn't mean they'll never be proficient, but it's, they're, they're highly correlated, right? The, the higher the proficiency, the higher the literacy and language skills in that first language, the more they'll be able to trans, transfer to a second language. Um, and so the question is, once they start to learn the second language, what do you do with the first language? Well, you don't stop teaching it. You definitely continue teaching it you continue developing those first language skills. And we, we need to note that when we ask children to transition too early, this can, really, this can lead to either reduced success or reading failure in both languages. So we continue building those L1 skills this means that new concepts and learning content should be introduced and discussed in both languages. It allows students to think through new concepts using their familiar vocabulary of the first language. And actually, research shows that when you have children who are learning in a first and second language, and they're expected to produce some type of oral or written product in the second language, they perform better when they're first able to discuss that content in their first language. And there's some research in Kenya that um, shows that the importance of those really acquiring first uh, strong skills in the L1, right? So, <coughs> pardon me. So, English language in Kenya, they were transitioning to English language. And they found that the poorer the first language skills were, the poorer their English language skills are. So this really solidifies the evidence that we need to develop that first, those first language skills and we need to continue developing those first language skills as they're learning a second language. Because we know that basic literacy skills and knowledge transfer, right? Everything under the bottom is this common underlying pro proficiency Understanding that print represents speech and carries meaning, those things only need to be learned once, like learning how to blend sounds to read words. Those skills automatically transfer to a second language, as well as things like phonological awareness and some, uh, some of the more basic literacy skills. But concept knowledge also transfers, because if I learn in science class about the life cycle of a butterfly, then when I learn that in the second language, I only need to learn the words that label the, the life cycle. I don't have to learn the concept all over again. I just have to learn the words that label the new stages, right? Um, similar features across languages transfer very easily. Directionality of print, the phonetic structure, if there are any cognates, if the orthographic system is similar. Therefore, the better we develop those literacy skills in the first language, the more prepared the child is to transfer those skills to a second language. And then the skills become reciprocal, right? So each language begins to support one another. Now the unique features are those differences, and the differences can interfere with language learning. They can cause confusion for language learners. For example, if a child first learns to read in Arabic and is later to ask, ask to read in English, he may automatically begin reading on the right side of the page and, and follow the direction to the left because Arabic text flows from right to left. So teachers have to be very explicit um, when they begin teaching a second language. They have to be very explicit about the differences and the trouble spots that children may encounter as they're transitioning to the second language. <clears throat> 
So what are the factors that influence a child's acquisition? Well, we've talked about properties of language. We've talked about time of instruction. We've talked about quality of instruction and exposure to the out, outside the classroom. Now, Nakamura and Hoop, um, found, they did a study in India and they found that, you know, children need to ha be at a certain level before they transitioned. And this is some relatively new research that's being done is looking at, you know, what are the thresholds? Where, where do children need to be? How much instruction, how much fluency, how much literacy skill do they need in their first language before they transition? And that's really going to be dependent upon the properties of the languages being learned. Because like I said, if they're both alphabetic and they both have very few graphemes and the graphemes are similarly used, that process is going to happen much faster. But what we want to happen is before a child begins learning in a second language, right? We want those children to begin developing their oral language skills in that second language. Learning how to read in their first language and learning the language of the second language at the same time, that's fine. But the reading process, how to read, that, how to um, link letters to sound and blend those sounds together to make words and blend those words into phrases and become fluent, that really only needs to happen once. And it happens quickly and more efficiently when children experience that with their first language or in a language that they already know and speak because we know that some ch some children have multiple languages um, but if they go to school and they learn how to read in a language they already understand and speak that process is much much quicker so um i have a quick activity for you so i'd like you to zoom chat with us right think about the context where you work are evidence-based approaches to reading and language instruction being used? If not, why? Or how might you be able to support their use? And then I'd also like to think about, if you may, or maybe if you don't actually work in the field, tell us, tell us about one piece of information that you've learned today so far about effective approaches to reading and language. Do you have any additional questions to effective approaches to reading instruction and language? And we'll go ahead and monitor some questions as they come in. I'm seeing some really great questions come through. Um, talking about the transition from L1 to L2, I think really understanding where the children are, understanding where the children need to go, right? Um, So we also want to look at what's the purpose of learning the new language. And I notice, you know, some people say, well, the parents don't want them to learn the new language, right? Or they, they don't want them to learn in their mother tongue, pardon me. They want to go to school to teach them this language of power. Uh, and that, that comes with advocacy. I mean, that comes with advocating and helping the parents understand that the process of learning to read is going to go, is going to go smoother and be more efficient in the language they already understand. Um, when we when we bridge the two languages we want to really look at what's familiar and teaching that first so when you're developing a scope and sequence i think i talk about that a little bit later um, you want to make sure you're addressing the things that are similar in the second language first and very very clearly talking through what those differences are and helping the children understand what's going to be confusing them as they learn but teaching them the cognates, if there's anything similar, it helps empower children to recognize that they do actually know some of that language. Um, do, teach, do teachers need to be highly proficient in both L1 and L2 to su successfully instruct learners? Um, I mean, I think that teachers need to, I would say yes, I mean, yes, because they have to understand the similarities and the differences of the language. They need to be able to see the mistakes that the children are, are making, no matter which language they're using. And during language instruction, think back to if you have children, what you did with your children, right? They would say something, we would, we would copy and elaborate, maybe ask them for a little bit more information, model a slightly more complex structure, 
doing that with young learners requires that we are pretty fluent in that language and we're able to we're able to see where they're at and and support them and scaffold their language growth growth ever so slightly. I see uh, several questions on the topic. This is Allison of transitioning from a first language to a second language. Um, we have one participant who asked, is there anyone who's having success in facilitating this transition in Africa? And others who have noted that they've had trouble doing this, whether it's been Uganda, Mozambique, are two of the countries mentioned here. Um, I, we hear this question a lot. And I think that one of the first questions is asking, is it, um, is it truly a transition and, and that bridge that Dr. Barnes described, or is it one language is used in one grade or at one time, and then children are completely expected to learn everything in another language. Um, and if there isn't that bridge, yes, I think there is going to be a struggle because children won't have that ongoing support of learning in a familiar language to support their continued learning in a new language. And um, of course, if that's not what is happening, trying to deal with a policy or um, a rule that maybe is is difficult to change, we might consider thinking about how we use some of our assessment data um, to make some recommendations. Uh, some of you have mentioned that you, you have assessment data. Um, Dr. Barnes talked about the India study, which was done through the All Children Reading um, Grand Challenge to support um, USAID's work in reading um, instruction as a way to say, are children prepared to make this transition that they are expected to make and learn the curricular content they're expected to make. And so if children don't have those skills at the end of, say, primary three to be learning in a new language in primary four, we might be able to make some recommendations as to whether that transition is really going to be successful. Now, we know it's easier said than done, but it's one way that data and information can hopefully be used to do advocacy and to perhaps suggest some small scale trials of trying something different, if it's to continue using that first familiar language um, through when children are supposed to transition. And again, having that data in hand to say, when are children actually going to be successful in learning another language is one point of advocacy that might be um, used. Um, Adrian, do you want to speak more to some of the questions um, on how to teach in classrooms where more than one language might be spoken by the students? Um, I'm sorry, I was typing. Um, how, how to deal with more than one language for the students, or you have more than one home language, different children from different languages? I think the uh, question from several people has been, how can we support teaching and learning in classrooms where children have there's multiple first languages that children might be speaking, perhaps to different levels of proficiency. And my understanding of this comment is there's probably one language only that's being used for the reading instruction. Right. And I think um, in that situation, unfortunately, the teacher probably only speaks one or maybe two of those languages. And so I think that that's going to come down to really good um, uh, classroom management skills and being able to group children and find children that can speak both languages and work kind of interpretive-ish. And um, I mean, you have to get really creative in that situation because unfortunately when you've got, you know, a hundred languages in the area, you, we unfortunately do have to, you know, we couldn't, you can't provide individualized reading instruction to all 100 children, right? So we have to find a language that's close to or similar to the language that they most communicate best in. Um, and I think we have to get creative and we have to figure out what resources are available for the classroom, for the teacher, for the students themselves. Um, and if it's possible to build, you know, little supplementary readers or something, decodable books, something in the languages that are, are similar, um, but, but again, that gets into the issue of materials development is expensive and having high quality materials developed gets expensive. So if, if, there, if there are people here that have that situation where they're implementing a project where you've got multiple um, languages in the same classroom, what are some creative ways that you've, you've addressed it? 
A couple of people have talked again about the importance of building oral language skills uh, for children who might come to a classroom where the language for reading is not their home language or they may be less familiar with it. We'll talk a bit about how language mapping can help identify levels of language proficiency that teachers can use to inform their instruction. Um, I've heard from one early grade reading program that's been around for a while that is trying to introduce uh, a pilot version uh, for a teacher training program on giving some teachers better skills in teaching languages as second or other languages, so more strategies for how to do that. And I think as programs are getting into their second generation, some have been around for many years now, and as we, we start seeing the results of these programs, that's an opportunity to say what can we do better and to propose those modifications to programs, maybe starting at a small scale to say how can we meet the needs of all learners, and those might be learners in multilingual classrooms. Um, and what, you know, as Adrian said, inno innovative but also just evidence-based practices that we should be doing and maybe we haven't always been doing because there has been such a focus maybe initially on just standardizing orthographies and developing materials that this is a very, you know, a much longer process of doing all of that and using effective approaches in some of these more uh, multilingual environments. Right, and it might be a case that um, you, like you may have to identify a wider language of communication, a language that more people speak and use that as the initial reading instruction. Or if, if, the, if the case is that you absolutely cannot find a language that most of the children speak, or you have half the children speak, you know, you can't find a language that at least half of the children speak, then the focus needs to be on oral language development before we start teaching them how to read. I mean, if they cannot speak the language that they're going to learn how to read in, they're not going to be able to read in it. So we, we really need to kind of beef up that oral language development and make sure that they're learning those language skills. Yes, so thank you for that. And one participant also mentioned the importance that teachers' aides or parents can be brought in. And again, these are all things to try and see how they work, and different things might be more appropriate in different contexts. So thank you for that suggestion there. All right, so we'll keep monitoring the chat box and keep, these, uh, keep this topic going on uh, and keep addressing any questions that come up. Um, but we're going to move back to Allison now and go into steps to effectively incorporate language throughout an, an early grade reading program. Now, be, you know, understand that any of these subtopics, part one, part two, part three, we could talk about for hours. So um, if you feel like you're just kind of skimming the surface, please do look up the resources that we have or contact us directly and we're, we're happy to continue these discussions. Thanks, Adrian. I also wanted to call everyone's attention in case you um, stepped away or were busy writing us a chat that a link to the handouts was sent in the chat. So if you click on that, it will take you to a Google folder where we've temporarily put the handouts for the webinar. Um, as you see them come up, you can take a glance at them. And then all the materials as well as the PowerPoint will go up on the GRN website in the next day or so with a recording um, to follow. So steps to take to effectively incorporate language throughout an early grade reading program. Um, we've called this steps, but that, in, that in does imply some um, aspect of them being sequential. But in many cases, these are iterative. They might not all happen in the same order that we're, we're listing them. It's just really, in some ways, a checklist of a lot of things that you should be thinking about. And as I mentioned, programs have been going on for a long time. So if you see this list and think, well, we didn't, we didn't do that, so now we can't do that. I think, again, it's important to consider how can we go back and look at where we are and think about ways to improve and things that we could still be doing as we, in many cases, aim for programs to be scaled up at the national level and eventually sustained. So stakeholder involvement, we know this is kind of a buzz phrase that we hear and it certainly applies to all aspects of any work that's done to support education sector improvement. Um, but it really is something to emphasize over and over again as essential to addressing languages in our programs. Um, stakeholder involvement can help surface a lot of the existing attitudes and beliefs, help you to identify challenges at the outset of a program so you're not stumbling upon them when you're already deep into it, and also really to help you identify potential solutions for some of these problems by bringing people all together to gain consensus. Uh, stakeholders can be involved in language-related research, from the collection of early grade reading assessment data 
to language mapping, which we will talk about, which in some contexts has been extremely helpful in helping decision makers to really understand current day issues related to the language and figure out how to address them. Um, with that information, they can work together to figure out how to integrate language across early grade reading programs in the education sector um, more generally. Different stakeholders from Ministry of Education officials to parents and teachers might also have different needs when it comes to understanding language issues. So it's important to identify what those needs are. Uh, several folks have mentioned um, parents and caregiver attitudes, beliefs, and preferences. So it might be worth thinking about how we develop advocacy strategies, especially for them, presenting issues related to language not as a zero-sum game or as either or, but again, how children can best learn across different languages and also curricular content and making parents aware that their ultimate goal of having their children learn in school can be best supported by learning to read in a language that they already speak and understand. Um, some first-hand accounts of recent USAID programs who that have um, really addressed stakeholder issues and or grappled with them uh, are listed in this blue box here. We had a webinar back in March on language policy planning and practice. Uh, presenters shared experiences from Ethiopia, Nepal, and the Philippines. Um, these were joint presentations of government representatives along with their technical implementing partners to talk about the many issues that they've dealt with. And so I encourage you to check out those presentations and there's also a recording if you're interested. Um, so a first essential step, as we already mentioned, is um, gathering information about the language, uh, the languages, um, the education context uh, related to the language, um, the goals for, sorry, hit, hitting buttons here, the language policy and practice as well as education and learning goals. Sometimes it's really helpful to take a step back and figure and look at what does the education system really want to achieve? And how is that language related or not? What is the best way for children to learn that curricular content? Um, how do we get from where we are to where we want to be? And often these are not related to language. Um, so it's important to take that step back or think about how does language factor into um, what we want children to know. Teacher and student language and literacy proficiency, instructional time for teaching reading and language. And this can be something that during a program design phase, or even if a program is going through classroom observations, we can figure out how much time is both available and how much time is actually being used for teaching reading and language. Um, what are, materials are available for teaching reading and language? And we'll talk later about conducting materials inventory and reviewing the quality of materials with respect to both language and appropriateness for early grade reading uh, programs. And again, those past experiences, knowing where people have been helps you figure out how you need to get to where you want to be. Uh, becoming familiar with the sociolinguistic context, we talked about this as another big bucket. So some of the things to consider and to, to carry out include a language mapping exercise in the target geographic area where you're going to be working. Handout three summarizes three recent language ma mapping experiences and some shares some resources uh, for what those programs did. Um, Again, these, these were conducted for in countries and in context where programs had already been operating. And it was sort of an opportunity to say, well, let's really think about what, where we are in terms of how many classrooms are truly multilingual. Uh, where do we have a discrepancy between the languages that teachers speak and the languages that students speak? And it helps to ground truth what people might believe. Um, often it doesn't match reality due to changes, and sometimes there's a tendency to overestimate the number of challenges, uh, but sometimes they're underestimated as well. So these language mapping experiences, I think, are really vital for us to hear about from other programs and do in our programs if we haven't already. Um, determining language readiness, the level that the orthography or writing system has been standardized and can be used for developing early grade reading materials. Handout four uh, is an orthography assessment tool that can be a very helpful resource um, to identifying if you may need to be first working to standardize the orthography, something that a number of programs are doing. Handout 5 uh, is a case study from Uganda, 
which took quite a lengthy process to standardize orthographies for several languages before developing early grade reading materials. And I've recently heard um, experiences from Ghana and Afghanistan, where again, even though programs had been going, they realized there was a need to go back and do some of this ground ground work before moving on to develop materials that would be effective for teaching and learning. Identifying language dialects, one of you um, commented on this, and it is something that I think we do need to pay quite a bit more attention to. There's sometimes a consensus that a standardized version of a language should be used uh, across an, a wide geographic area without necessarily understanding if all children and teachers would be able to um, really use those materials effectively. And so as programs are um, doing their language mapping, understanding the real differences between dialects and if these are going to be creating a need for differentiated materials, or in cases where languages have already rolled out in one language, um, it would be helpful to find out if children across different dialects are learning um, equally or the outcomes are the same, or if materials might need to be differentiated by dialect. Um, and then learning, of course, about the language-related attitudes and beliefs. You'll see this is a current throughout because it really is something that is important to, to address and not try to just roll over. Uh, this slide is just an example of the language mapping results uh, from Mozambique. Uh, this mapping exercise was conducted to inform the design and implementation of a USAID-supported program in the country. Um, the program had been going for a little while, but the program partners conducted a language mapping exercise to really ground truth um, what they knew about children and teachers' language proficiency. Um, they measured oral language proficiency in all children in the two provinces where they were working using a semantic fluency test, which is one where children say as many words that come to mind when they're shown a picture as a prompt. Um, the, the results were really interesting, and I wanted to just share a few highlights because these um, findings are being used right now to inform the uh, continuation of the program. One thing was that they found a very normal distribution of skill language, uh, skill level across all language, which means that children had acquired, have acquired the foundational oral language skills that they need to support literacy instruction. So this is kind of a good news story in a context where, like many others, children generally were found not to be able to read fluently but it's saying children are coming to school with a lot of assets. We, they have oral language skills that we can really build on to develop other reading skills. They also found, though, that there were large mismatches between self-reported and objectively measured oral language skills. And this is an important point, too, for efforts that do want to measure uh, language proficiency, that really a standardized assessment tool is needed, that self-reporting is not sufficient when we want to make some really um, important decisions about what we're doing in our program. A third key takeaway was a significant mismatch between children's oral language skills and the language of instruction that had been assigned to their school. So you can see in this um, map these red dots, and that shows where there was the language mismatch of greater than 50% of the students speaking a different language as their familiar language than was assigned to their school. So right away, you can see you're going to have challenges if you're um, distributing materials in the language that is assigned to the school when really children are speaking something quite different. And this may be due to these assignments on language of instruction being made um, a long time ago, and languages may have shifted, or they may have not necessarily have been in informed by actual data from these areas. So this is um, certainly something the program needs to address if, you're, if they're going to be successful in teaching kids to read. And the other was in this particular context, they found a high percentage of schools that were li linguistically um, heterogeneous. But on the flip side is that now they know which schools they are, and they can be better targeting changes and in modifications to instruction or some of those additional supports that you mentioned, either training those teachers to be providing additional support to those speakers of other languages if only one language is chosen for instruction, perhaps considering uh, instruction in two languages at schools, where maybe that is a more effective approach depending also on the teachers that are available to teach those languages. So a lot of really, really good information um, from language mapping and the time and effort and resources put into it. And again, there's some other very recent examples in that handout. 
<clears throat> identifying the languages to be used for literacy and language instruction. So this isn't the first thing we do, right? It comes somewhere after we've done a lot of the uh, research, identifying um, sociolinguistic context or defining it, figuring out what languages are spoken and by who and by where, doing that language mapping work to identify what percentage of the kids speak what languages. Um, people do often mention, well, there's 100 languages spoken in the country or 500 languages spoken in the country. But language mapping can really help to ground truth um, what percentage of kids speak what languages. And it might be that five languages or 10 languages can cover a very significant percentage of the population. And as programs you know, continue over years, they may be able to add additional languages, but that we can start somewhere and we can ground truth where we start based on some, some data. Um, we've talked again several times about education and language learning goals. It's helping us to decide also what languages should we be using for reading instruction. Orthography readiness. Um, we need to identify what languages are ready. It might be that some are ready before others, and so that's again a consideration in how we stagger the introduction and use of languages for reading programs. Similarities between languages. Some languages are more similar to, the, to others, so it can be more efficient and can happen more quickly to develop materials for the languages that are similar to each other than those that might be significantly different, and that's where the involvement of your team, your, your linguist, and all of the folks who can really help you to understand um, language issues will be um, really useful. Um, availability of materials and other resources, um, an inventory of those is, is helpful to understanding what's available. It might be that some languages have more materials than others and that therefore might be ready to use more quickly than others. Of course, even if no materials are available, that doesn't mean a language shouldn't be used, just that time and resources will need to be budgeted for when you want, if you want to use that language um, for instruction. And of course, timeline and funding. Um, decisions about which languages to use will depend on the amount of funds and time available, but it's important to remember um, that each additional language that's used for reading instruction may not necessarily cost the exact same amount, since some costs will be the same no matter how many languages are included, while other costs may be additional um, for, for the language. And I know several of the participants um, who are joining us today have a lot of experience and might be able to speak uh, in more detail about this um, if we want to during some of the question and answer time. But it's really something that needs thoughtful planning in advance, and I think it's something that can help dispel some of the um, naysayers that sometimes crop up when we talk about providing reading instruction in several languages as we really just need to help plan this out and map it out and develop the budget and really talk about the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of putting in the resources now because of the learning outcome gains that we will hopefully get over the status quo. Just a quick poll to hear from you. How many languages are being used for reading instruction in your country? And we'll bring this up right now. We'll launch a poll. If you could just take 10 seconds to tell us how many languages you're using for reading instruction in your country. Great. So we just, we just um, stopped the poll here with the folks that have um, responded. We have about 25 responses. and. It looks like half of you are dealing with five or more languages, um, and then also three and two, and a smaller number dealing with just one. So certainly, um, we'd love to hear from you about some of the how you made those decisions about which languages to use and how that um, decision is playing out. So we're going to move to a, another opportunity to share some of your experiences and also to ask us some questions. Um, reflecting on the first four steps that we've discussed here, what information have you been able to gather about your sociolinguistic and educational context, and how did you do so? Um, how was that information you gathered used to inform your program design and implementation? Did it help you choose which languages to use or not? And what are some of the information gaps you still feel you have that you need to um, find answers to.
And then if you'd like to add, of course, any questions, we'll happy to take those. I see one participant has written about another benefit of language mapping that I didn't highlight is about lending legitimacy to the approach that you're using. So sharing that data widely, helping people to understand the context can lend the legitimacy to why you might need to be teaching instruction orally for your second language, in this case, Portuguese. Um, well, reading instruction is going on first in the L2. So thank you for that um, comment about how language mapping really is also a strategy for advocacy. Uh, we see in the Philippines, there's 19 official mother tongue languages that are um, being used, as I understand, for reading instruction. And um, we heard from colleagues in the Philippines at that webinar I mentioned earlier, and it certainly sounds like quite a tremendous collaborative effort there that we can all take some lessons learned from. We have a comment related to orthography standardization that it can be a political issue. It can take years <laughs> in some cases, and that is certainly an important um, consideration. Um, this person recommends implementing perhaps a school standard that is understood to be experimental, maybe as a longer process is taking place. Um, thank you very much for that suggestion. I know in the Uganda case, they knew that that would have to take place, and they did end up using, I think, at least half a year to do that through already established language boards. So again, something to learn about in your context. If you know orthography needs to be worked on, figuring out what the process is and what the timeline is, and maybe how that can be supported to take place in maybe a quicker fashion can be really helpful at the program planning stage. Uh, we see a comment from one of our colleagues in Haiti um, talking about two official languages, both French and Creole. There's still an ongoing debate about the use of Creole, um, but both are used. And, and again, ground truthing that would be interesting to hear. I, I think previous programs may have captured information about um, time spent in the classroom and then linking that to the actual outcomes, how well are children doing in classrooms where maybe one is used more than the other or different strategies are used can be very helpful in making some recommendations about how to continue to move forward or where more time needs to be spent. Thanks to the other um, participant from, uh, excuse me, speaking to the issue of teacher proficiency in languages. We're going to be getting into that shortly here. Um, there's something to really really keep in mind. Um, teachers unions are an important stakeholder um, when making a lot of these decisions and they certainly are one of those groups that should be at the table um, but frequently are not as we kind of work through official Ministry of Education channels but needing to be mindful um, that assessing teachers and um, teacher placement, these are all issues that need to be really um, made with teacher unions or other um, representatives of teachers groups. And I also want to note the comment about um, when, when the orthography is still being standardized, right? Yeah, often we do have some serious critical information that's not part of the, the written orthography, like the nasal vowels. How frequently do those sounds occur? It's, diffi it's difficult to know how frequently the sounds occur if the language isn't written down and then we're supposed to teach the most frequent sounds first. But we also do typically teach all the vowels and its um, consonants that we teach in order of frequency. Um, and tonality, is, is the tonality important in the language? Um, that, that's a very important consideration that, so you know, when, you, when you get these people together and you're, and you're starting to work through this, all of these are very important questions to bring up. And I think sometimes we all realize, uh, as, as a few people have mentioned, sometimes what we might think is the best approach is just not feasible. And I think that is something we need to try to um, have very small scale pilots to try to have proofs of concept that perhaps uh, a revised orthography may be more effective in teaching kids to read. Um, or a, a new approach of having a teacher's aide who speaks the language of some of the kids may help those kids to learn like the other students who are speaking the languages already that are being used and trying to have those points of 
proof of concept, if you will, um, is something as programs are expanding, they may be able to integrate better now. Well, please send us um, any information gaps or questions that you have um, as we now move on to talking about how we apply the best practices for teaching reading and language that Adrian had described earlier to actually building our programs. So children who come in with strong oral language skills, uh, we know that they're better readers. And if they don't have the strong language skills when they come into the classroom, the teacher has to help them develop those language skills. Language skills are developed like any other skill. You have to practice it, which means children need to be talking. They need to have opportunities to engage with one another or in whole group discussions or talking to the teacher. If they're sitting there silently listening to the teacher lecture, they're not developing their language skills. They, those skills build the framework for building literacy skills. We're not able to do something, any skill, with, with text that we can't do orally. So children who learn to communicate well, they have well-developed vocabularies, they can engage in discussions, they can ask and answer questions, they learn to read easier. They also have better comprehension of what they read. And then they have more skills to transfer when, they when we ask them to transfer or learn a second language. Now, if they're coming to school and they're learning to read in a language that's not necessarily their first language, we have to develop those language skills before we get them reading. And since we know that this, that L1 and L2 skills support one another, children should be encouraged to continue learning and developing academic language in their L1 because we don't want the children to be lost between two languages. That they start learning in that second language and then they stop learning in their first, then they're never really flu fully fluent or fully literate in, in either language. So we have to maintain that instruction in both languages and support a gradual transition to learning in that second or third or fourth or fifth language, whatever it is for the child, because it's a developmental progression. We have to give them time to process, time to develop the neurological pathways. We have to give them time to develop the literacy skills, the language skills, and eventually transition to slowly to that new language. It's unfortunate when we see children come in in grade one, they start learning to read in a language they don't really speak, or if they do get mother tongue instruction, they start learning to read in in an additional language in grade one or grade two. And then by third grade, they've got no support from their first language because everything is in this new language. Um, so supporting that gradual transition, making sure that children are able to fall back on their first language and making that part of the curriculum and, and helping stakeholders really understand that. So when we develop the scope and sequence, right, the scope and sequence is, the scope is all of the skills that we teach in a curriculum, and the sequence is the order that we teach those skills in. So when we develop a scope and sequence for a second or additional language, we want to first focus on those language features that are similar across the languages, the properties that are similar, and then very clearly differentiate the differences. We explicitly teach the features that are dissimilar across the languages. This means that language type, language properties, language ortho orthographies, all of these need to be very well understood and analyzed for similarities and differences. Structure, orthographic characteristics like alphabetic versus syllabic or type, is it an agglutinating language? Is it a very transparent language? All of these are going to in, impact the type of instruction that children receive. For example, a syllabic language, if, if children are learning how to read in a syllabic language, they don't need to learn phonological awareness all the way down to the individual phonemes. They only need to learn phonological awareness down to the syllable level. It'll impact phonological awareness instruction, phonics instruction, decoding instruction, all of those. And then the, in the blue box, you see, I'm, I'm going back to that comment I made earlier, that learning how to read and learning how to speak a language are two separate subjects. 
So in the scope and sequence, in the curriculum, they should have different time blocks during the day. They should be using different types of materials. And the reason is because uh, materials that you use for teaching a child how to read are going to be decodable materials, materials that the children are going to practice reading themselves. If you're teaching a language, you're going to be more focusing on the oral language development, not on the print. So the children for oral language activities in a second language, they might not even need a student book. You might just have pictures or posters or um, read alouds that the teacher does and then works the children through listening comprehension activities. So you're going to be using different materials, whether you're teaching reading or teaching a language and implementing different yet synergistic instructional strategies, right? So you still wanna tap into whatever knowledge they have in their first language, that background knowledge, you start transferring it to the second language as you're teaching that language instruction. Uh, but they should definitely be two separate subjects taught at two different times. We talked earlier briefly about how a certain level of skill in the first language is necessary before students are ready to begin learning in a second or additional language. Those language thresholds should be investigated for the given languages. Um, I mentioned the frame study early from uh, Nakamura and Hoop that was funded through the All Children Reading Grand Challenge Initiative. Um, they found, you know, that children need to be able, if they are able to read fluently in their first language, then they could transfer those skills. We need to include a systematic and explicit instruction in all skill areas in our reading program. And when, when laying out that scope and sequence, when identifying what to teach and how to teach it, we should be engaging the reading specialists, the language or linguistic specialists, the any any early grade reading specialists any early grade teaching specialists that are that are in the country that are familiar with the context that are familiar with the language because these are the people that are going to identify how to most appropriately teach reading in that specific language uh, a handout seven there's a role of linguistics and content materials development that you'll want to take at take a look at it looks really describes language specific processes, tools, uh, steps that you can take as you're going through that, going through that process. Yeah, and I, I just might add about those handouts, if you take a look, you'll see it's, a, it's actually a presentation about how this, uh, some considerations in Ghana, and the other presentations describe some considerations in other countries, Cambodia, um, as well as, I believe, uh, Nepal and Ethiopia. So, um, as Adrian talked about thinking how to apply what we know about effective approaches to teaching reading and language to the instructional content, we also have to think about how those issues apply to materials design and use. We've already mentioned the need for conducting an inventory of available materials and analyzing also the quality of those materials, identify what could be used, what might need to be adapted, and what new materials um, might need to be um, developed. Um, sometimes programs say, well, it's, you know, it's too much of a challenge, or, or governments might say to provide reading instruction uh, in languages that children understand because we have to develop so many new materials. But really, conducting an inventory can help to first identify, again, what you really need and what you need to develop from, from scratch. And um, also developing a plan for doing all of that can make it seem um, more manageable. Um, countries that have successfully produced materials in multiple languages include Ethiopia, uh, seven languages, Ghana, 12, Uganda, 12. I know Philippines is up there in, in that number um, as, as well. And you'll see handout um, from another session, session two, which we had last week, talks about very specific strategies for, and tools for developing materials um, across multiple languages. Um, standardizing orthography, we've mentioned already some experiences from Uganda and uh, other, other places, and Ghana was mentioned where they just underwent that process and are trying uh, on different orthographies in some cases. Use of software, such as the Bloom software developed by SIL, 
lead to analyze language, inform the scope or sequence, or in other words, the content and order um, that you're using for teaching different reading uh, skills and developing the text. Um, this software was developed with the support of USA through the All Children Reading Grand Challenge as a way to really help early grade reading programs to analyze languages and be able to get um, information to help them produce materials such as decodable text, which need to be uh, control text that you need to introduce uh, letters and graphemes and, and words in a sequence that children would be able to read based on what they've already learned. So if you are not familiar with this, the Global Reading Network's website has a number of materials on how to use Bloom, as does the SIL Lead website, and you'll see URLs in the resources and, and, and references section. But it's good to know that these are, again, out there as a means to support materials development in as timely manner as possible. Developing quality control processes and tools, certainly this is applicable whether you're, mater you're developing materials in one language or 15, but I think it's ever more important when you're talking about developing materials across many, many languages that trying to keep version control and trying to keep the material similar across multiple languages requires a really firm approach to quality control. And some of the early grade reading programs have provided their quality control processes and experiences and tools, um, many of which are in session two on developing materials in multiple languages. So I really encourage you to um, check those out um, if you're needing some tips on how you might manage that process in your country. Um, and then involving teachers, students, community members, local story writers, language specialists in the development of materials in different roles. Those who have had the most success talk about really hearing from community um, about you know, what content is most relevant and working with students and field testing materials to see what they're finding to be most interesting. Uh, but of course, working with content area specialists and reading specialists to make sure that those materials are appropriate um, for the languages. And handout eight has a summary of some of these language specific considerations, uh, more than we could certainly fit on a slide. And we're always interested in hearing from you about things that you've learned and would recommend to others as they develop materials in multiple languages. Um, here's a, a summary of some additional uh, resources besides Bloom. Um, SIL provides free online resources to support materials development. Some of that includes fonts, the language analysis software I mentioned, and shell books. Uh, we talked about Bloom, but other language analysis software includes Primer Pro and Symphony. Um, and again, it's a matter of finding out what, what works for you and, and thinking about the different needs of, of people that are working in your program. And as I mentioned, we don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel on everything. We have can conduct inventories to see what's available. There's more and more multilingual digital libraries that have openly licensed materials that can be adapted, that can be even just downloaded for use. Um, the Global Digital Library is one that's been developed to support USA programs, and they're busily working to populate that. The Bloom Library of Bloom Produced Resources, some specific to Asia include Let's Read. There's several that are specific to Sub-Saharan Africa, and if you check out handout nine, those are summarized there. And we'll go back to Adrian to talk a bit about teacher professional development. Okay, yeah, teacher professional development. There are certain skills and language-related re knowledge that teachers need in order to be successful at teaching children how to read, right? They have to be able to, they have to, be able to fluently speak read and write in the language of instruction um, and communicate, right? So wider communication in that language of reading instruction. They have to understand the advantages of teaching children how to read in a familiar language. They have to be able to use evidence-based and appropriate instructional practices for teaching children to read in both their first and other languages. Um, they have to kind of know the orthography, the sound structure, the spelling patterns, they have to also be respectful, right? So uh, they have to be respectful of the language, the language speak speakers that they're teaching, um, where those children come from, the language from, from, from whence they come. 
uh, in their familial language patterns. Program implementers have to be able to understand the knowledge and the skills that teachers already have as well as what they do not have so that appropriate professional development opportunities can be provided. It's really important to note that teachers who are expected to provide literacy and language instruction in multiple languages will need extra support to help them understand how to teach in both languages. Um, if they're teaching in a second or additional language, they're going to need in-depth and ongoing professional development opportunities so that they can provide appropriate evidence-based practices. Now, assessing teacher knowledge, skills, literacy knowledge, practices is very, very political. Someone commented on it earlier that teachers get very aggressive, they get very um, defensive. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide, but um, we have to take steps so that we know where the teachers are and what they need, right? Uh, we have to assess their language skills so that we know what type of materials do we have to develop. For example, if we have a teacher's guide, if it's in the second language, does it, do there need to be notes in a, a different language to help them understand what they're supposed to be teaching? Um, do they need specific professional development or language development? Um, and, and also understanding their, their strengths and weaknesses will support making sure that student-teacher language match happens in the schools. Um, teachers have to learn about the properties of their language, the sound systems, the spellings. They need to differentiate between literacy and language instruction. What are effective practices for first and second language instruction? How to support children's transfer of skills from one language to another? Um, and, and then in professional development, we may actually have to provide teachers with appropriate teaching and learning materials that help them build their own language skills that support effective instruction. And uh, we might want to integrate opportunities to improve their language skills, both in pre-service and in-service teacher training. Maybe helping them understand and support diverse cultures or engage in peer study circles or individual or one-on-one -on -one app based learning. We have to provide as many um, opportunities for teachers to learn as possible and we can only do that if we know what they need to learn. So let's talk about teacher assessing teacher language knowledge skills and practices right and I just said that this informs our professional development materials our content teacher placement requires thoughtful planning and appropriate tools Early grade reading program implementers need to thoughtfully plan how to use teachers' language and literacy skills and how to assess those skills. What, what knowledge of, and skills need to be known and what should be assessed? What are the appropriate tools and methods for doing so? And how can we do that in a professional manner that makes those teachers feel comfortable? Um, handout 10 is about assessing teacher language and literacy skills and it describes three different countries experiences in doing that assessment in the context of early grade reading programs. But those findings should only be used for designing the program, for designing the materials, for designing the professional development because we know that any assessment of the teacher's knowledge, skills, attitudes, beliefs, anything if, they're, if it's used in a, inappropriately, there could be major consequences. They could, they could lose their job, right? If, if the government finds out that only 2% of the teachers can actually read in the language they're speaking, they might go through and fire all those teachers. So we have to be very careful. We should never use the results to penalize, sanction, or fire teachers. Education authorities they might be interested in this information. They want to support you with this data gathering because they want to take those data in. So we should make sure that we are not sharing that data with individuals or with, if it is shared, that individual teachers cannot be identified from those data that are shared. Um, I think the next slide, we're going to go on to a quick Zoom chat, right? How has your reading program addressed and incorporated language issues to respect to teacher professional development? Have you assessed teacher language and literacy skills? 
you can share a few thoughts. We'll talk through them before we move on to the next session. If you haven't done um, any sort of assessment of teacher uh, language and literacy skills, knowledge, or attitudes, um, we'd be interested to hear maybe why or some of the challenges that you've encountered if you've tried to do that. Um, and you could also take a minute to check out the handout um, on this topic, summarizes some experiences from early grade reading programs where they've done this in various uh, forms and what they have found from that experience. Okay, so I suggest we move on into uh, monitoring and evaluation. So let's talk about incorporating language into early grade literacy program monitoring, evaluation, research, and learning. Um, we really need to definitely address language very specifically. Um, so some examples of this language-related research is, you know, what is, their, what is the children's progression over time? Are skill specific thrust, what are the skill-specific thresholds for L1 to L2 or LX learning? What skills and instructional strategies are more effective for certain languages? Like I said, with phonological awareness and phonics instruction, that's going to be different. There's going to be more effective strategies. There are others as well. What strategies are most effective in multilingual classroom contexts? If you have multi-languages, are there cognates that are common? Is there um, a wider language that's common that you can use as a foundation to, to deal with all of those other languages? Um, but programs should disaggregate their reading outcomes, right, by the language being learned and disaggregate results by students' first language or their home language report language-related relate, related results appropriately, and assess teacher language skills. But we need to be more attentive in how we do that assessment and measuring and measurement of language-related skills, right? Language-focused monitoring, evaluation, and learning helps to shed some much-needed insight into what is working and what is not with respect to instruction and student outcomes. Small-scale proofs of concept or pilot studies are really useful in trying out a new approach to language-related instruction, such as providing additional instructional support to children who may not be proficient in the language used for reading instruction. Another area for language-related research and learning is to better understand the progression of student language and reading skills over time and across languages. Longitudinal studies of a small sample of students could help shed some light on a number of these issues. Um, and so um, a quick note about reporting, right? Reporting language relating results appropriately. There are two big issues here. So when you're comparing across languages, we want to compare zero scores, not like if you're doing oral reading fluency. If you, if you report correct words per minute, words correct per minute, right? Words correct per minute in one language is not going to mean the same thing. If you say 50 words correct per minute in one language and then 50 words correct per minute in another language, if that second language is an agglutinating language, then those words are going to be a lot longer and that 50 words per minute is going to mean more and that's a higher level of performance than 50 words per minute in a language like English that is not an agglutinating language where we, you know, individual words and so we want to look at, if you're looking at oral reading fluency, per se, uh, zero scores. Because a zero score in English and a zero score in agglutinating language is going to mean the same thing. Percentage of children that are at zero scores versus what's the average words correct per minute. So because, you know, measuring fluency or measuring or, you know, measuring any of these skills may not be appropriate when you're going across languages. Um, in MHARC, the unit of measurement is a fidela, the syllable level. So uh, you really need to have a discussion about what's appropriate for the language um, and when those, when those findings are reported out that, that we really need to focus on some measure that's the same across languages rather than getting caught up in uh, trying, to, trying to find a number. That, that's the benchmark that we should be setting across languages because it's not really appropriate. Um, bilingual reading trajectories. So it's important to recognize that children's reading skills are not going to develop the same at the same pace when they're learning in multiple languages. Um, and this really depends on the point at which a second or additional language is introduced 
the types of instruction received, the, the exposure to print, the practice. Um, but children really, when they, when they truly become bilingual, maybe by the middle grades, if they've received appropriate instruction, they've had enough practice, they've, they've been given time and materials and plenty of experiences, then we see that by the middle grades, they actually build true bilingual literacy and bilingual fluency. Um, when we looked at what is expected versus what is practical, um, we have to be careful, right? Because developmental progression, cognitive development, we have to be aware that children can only learn so much in a short period of time. And there was a question earlier, do we not even begin oral reading into, or oral language until we start teaching reading? If we can start the oral language in the second language, in the second language, L2, oral language skills, as soon as they begin school, then when we ask them to transition to reading that language, they've already got a strong foundation of language skills so that they can become literate in that second language quicker. Thanks, Adrian. Um, last but not least, um, our final sort of step in this a series of thinking about what to gather more information on and how to apply it. Is it um, how to effectively address language issues through communication and advocacy? Um, building awareness and obtaining consensus can be brought about by engaging in targeted and sustained communication and advocacy. So having conversations on an ongoing basis, even from before a program is designed to inform it, to through the design phase, to implementation, to how we adapt our implementation based on what we learn from monitoring and evaluations, soliciting the perspective of, of all stakeholders, as we've mentioned. Um, involving stakeholders in research and data collection about language issues, sometimes it's that direct involvement in gathering information about what's happening that can really help bring about that awareness and really give people the motivation to try out some new, new ways of doing things, things that may not be um, possible to just ask people to change, but when they're really involved in seeing what's happening and seeing the data that comes out from this research gathering. Providing learning and professional development opportunities. We've talked about some of the misconceptions that people might have, like if we teach in, in first languages, or familiar languages, it might be at the expense of learning another language, and often that's because people believe that the earlier you start teaching a foreign language to children, the better they will learn it, which is not necessarily true um, in, in many contexts. And so really providing some opportunities for learning and professional development to educate people in the appropriate way about effective approaches to reading instruction and languages, whether it's workshops, one-on-one -on -one training, um, or communicating through other means. Um, which brings us to the last point about using um, briefs or radio, television, other media to reach specific groups. Um, certain, several projects have done these kinds of communication campaigns around what different early grade reading programs are doing so parents are aware. Um, this policy brief example here for a program in Nigeria was developed to understand this issue of teaching in familiar languages and transitioning to English. So really building that into your timeline and budget uh, for the communication and advocacy. So we have one last opportunity here today, that is for sharing and reflection. Um, reflecting on the key steps that we just presented, um, any last thoughts on what you have found to be challenging, what you have been particularly successful at, and any guidance you have from others who might be struggling with these issues. In the box, you'll see the two more handouts listed. One is on strategies for addressing the issues we discussed, just summarized in a, a little different format. And handout 13, which is a planning tool that lists all these steps and different activities, questions, and considerations around them. It, think of this as kind of your two-page cheat sheet, summarizing them that you might consider reviewing with your program planning and design team to say, have, have we done all these things? Have we thought about these things? Have we collected all this information to really best understand how to go about things? So we'll just take a few minutes for some final reflections and an opportunity for you to look at those resources. I had a few final um, comments here about 
um, alignment and not seeing, again, language and reading instruction is completely separate depending on the language. And I think it's a really good point to bring out um, to emphasize that to the extent possible, we're able to align content, but even resource design. Often you'll see the materials for one language look completely different than the materials for another language, and that is just an extra effort that teachers need to um, put into understanding lesson plan flow and content, but making it so teachers, especially if they're teaching both of those languages, um, they can they can follow similar formats and children themselves also see the relationships and not the necessarily um, feel like they're completely always separated when that is appropriate, of course, to be to be teaching um, the relationships. Um, we have another comment about the resources for children in, I believe it was refugee context or co conflict and crisis context. And yes, I apologize, we didn't mention that. Um, I know it was in our notes somewhere to talk about language issues are can be really particularly salient in those contexts for many reasons. And children who are, of course, in refugee context may be put in together with children who speak other languages. Classrooms might be multilingual. Teachers may not speak those languages. And so, again, getting back to figuring out your context mapping those languages, levels of proficiency, what different supports might be needed in that context. Um, the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies, INEE, has some great resources as well that you can consult in addition to the ones we're providing. Those links are provided um, in, in one of our webinar sessions, and I'll make sure to highlight that, um, thinking about teaching and learning in those contexts. Um, is really is really important for equity and of course for safety and security too. Um, a couple of you, many of you, have actually mentioned resources from your own programs. I just wanted to note that if you'd like to share those uh, with the Global Reading Network and with the other others here, please just uh, feel free to shoot us an email at the Global Reading Network's email address on our website. Um, I will have my email address here too as we end. Um, we're happy to share those if they're not already publicly accessible um, by posting them to our website. We can also put information about them on our website and include a link to where they live on your website um, if, if they're already out there somewhere. Be um, everything you've seen here today was really shared with us by program implementers and, and others. And so, you know, if you think you have a great example for anything you see here today or anything in the other webinars, please feel free to share it. This is really a, a training and resource module that's only as good as um, all the resources we get from you to share with others. And I'd just like to again say thank you to many who did, did share their, their resources. So as we wrap up our time here, just a few takeaways. Um, as I know many of you know, and we've tried to emphasize throughout this webinar, language applies to all aspects of early grade reading improvement. There's, there's really nothing you can say is language uh, independent, so it's critical that we all understand these issues and we really try to plan for them at the earliest stages. That we take time to understand the context where we're working and also the available evidence as it relates generally but also specifically to our context and that we engage in that collaborative process at all points to build consensus on how to move forward and make decisions. And grounding those decisions and evidence and best practices, there's not necessarily the very easy answer in some places, but we do know a lot about what works and we can continue to monitor, evaluate, and adjust what we're doing if we gather the information as we go along to figure out what's working and what could be done even better. So for more information, you can check out the resources that we've included as well as this resource on planning for language use and education, which um, in the near future, we hope to engage in a collaborative effort to update it with even more recent experiences from early grade reading programs. Uh, if you don't already, please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, any of the social media. This is a great place also to share links to your resources. Um, we also invite you, if you'd like, to um, contribute to the Global Reading Network's newsletter. We can highlight resources there. Um, we also invite people to write blogs about their experiences, and these are informal pieces that we publish occasionally. 
So once again, thanks for making the time out of your busy schedules uh, to attend. Next um, Thursday, in two days, we have another webinar on teacher professional development and coaching, um, which is going to be delivered by Marian Fessmer and Amy Polanjo. So if you haven't already, please, please register for that. Well, thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you at an upcoming event.